All right. So we're here again, guys, with Nicole Brewster from Renfort Resources. Nicole, who came out with a press release last week that's uh, pretty interesting, and I thought it'd be a good idea to look look it over with Nicole, probably give us a little bit more insight so that we understand exactly what the press release is all about, and possibly even get uh, sort of, uh, uh, in French, we say aperçu for what's coming up for Renfort during this uh, the summer season. So, Nicole, how are things at Renfort? Hey, good to see you again. Everything's going great. From the guys over there. Now, with the work that they've done with this press release, tell us a little bit about it. And the words that I'm reading correct are increase in frequency and thickness of mineralized graphitic mudstone layers. What does that mean? Correct. <laughs> so what it means is the, the big takeaway from this program, we were drilling into a magnetic high and we were expecting to, to hit uh, a thicker area of the ultramafic, which gives us the nickel cobalt platinum group platinum palladium but what we actually got was the graphitic mudstone and it's interesting because the very first hole we drilled in surimo we drilled into graphitic mudstone right off the bat mineralized and you know decent numbers nickel and zinc a bit of a head scratcher because as we went on what we saw was we've got the the shear zone giving us copper zinc and then we've got the ultramafic giving us nickel cobalt and they're interlayered that's been the story at surimo that we've been talking about and we drilled off 2.2 kilometers of it well we jumped four kilometers west we jumped over some historic work but we really took a big jump into an area that had never been explored until we did some prospecting when we did the prospecting we saw similar mineralization to the 2.2 kilometer stuff in the very west so we're drilling it thinking we're going to see the same thing when we drill it but what we actually saw was the graphitic mudstone over and over again and getting much thicker tens of meters thick and more, occurring more than once in a drill hole so layering it's interesting because the graphitic mudstone it can be very important, a graphitic shale. It is very important in certain parts of the world. It hosts mineralization. It's an element of a classic VMS. It can also host the VMS. In this case, it gives us um, both nickel and zinc. It gives us grades that range, which I can't speak to off the top of my head, but low grade to kind of typical nickel grades on this property or in the 0.2 range. Uh, and the zinc, it's a couple of percentage points. It can be up to, you know, quite a few percentage points. But it's more important that we're seeing so much of it because now we know we have it over six kilometers. The implication of the graphitic shale or the mudstone is that it can it can carry over a large extent. It's carbon. It was a subsea floor a long time ago. So it can undulate and move like a sea floor, or like, you know, a lake bottom would. But it can go for a long ways, like a seafloor would. So we can't even really say how what's the consistent level of mineralization because we haven't stopped to look at it. We're literally now going back through the logs, and uh, geologists are picking out the occurrences, and we're going to look at it as its own third element of interest on the property. So it's important anyway. It has the potential to be very important. Dr. Franklin's comment was, "We're now on the." We're now on the horizon of the VMS. We just need to find the uh, find the center of it, kind of thing. Find the area of interest. But we're in the right place now. That's his uh, his take on it. He's taken all the data, and he'll be working his uh, geophysical, geochemical, geostatistical magic on it. So it actually it's quite exciting. It's quite boring on the one hand, like it's really not a lot to say, right? But what we're really saying is we've got we've got this. We saw it before, but we it was narrow in spots. We see it on surface. It's right beside the road when you walk on the property. We were treated it as a marker horizon. It was on the south side of the mineralized package. We'd see it, then we'd see the what we thought was the mineralized package, not realizing that we've drilled off 2.2 kilometers. The total meters of drilling to do that, well, I don't even know off the top of my head, but I, I'm willing to bet it's less than 5,000 meters of drilling over 2.2 kilometers. That's not a lot of drilling. It's not very tight. Um, it leaves a lot of spaces between the drill holes. So when we looked at it, we'd see it narrow in a couple spots. We're like, that's fine. It's a marker horizon. Not going back to the very first holes we drilled where it was thicker. And then we see it get much thicker on the west end. So now we sit back and we're like, 
no, no, don't ignore this. This is the kind of mineralization that my father was doing some research. And there's one occurrence in the world, and I forget where. But the uh, the mineralization itself, the, the graphitic mudstone horizon, is less than a foot in thickness. Okay. It goes forever. Extremely high grade. So less than a foot at the right angle at a high grade, it can be mined. We really? seem to right now have wider widths with a lower grade, but again, it's black. It's in gray rock. You can sort it. You can concentrate it. And it's the material that the terrafame mine actually mines. They're heat leach. It's a it's a mud, it's a graphitic shale. So that's the actual material. The mine that I'm inspired by. The reason I'm inspired by it is their mining method. It's heat bleach. It's very environmentally friendly, and they produce nickel chemistry and cobalt chemistry. They don't produce. Uh, they don't smelt. They don't have to smelter it. All of that aside, they're actually working with a graphitic mudstone. So it's quite exciting. You know, we don't know everything about Suramo yet. Suramo is frustrating because we can't say what it is yet. It's really big. It's mineralized. It's a big mineralized system. So now we have three factors to that large-scale mineralized system. So that's it. That's the news. It's good news. It's unusual news. It's unusual the way I put it out, which is very deliberate because we're learning what Suramo is and we're approaching the point where until we can definitively say what it is, we we can't. I'm not even going to guess. Because now, you mention often heap leach. How many heap leach mines are there in Canada? Oh, I don't know. But I mean, typically our our climate would not be conducive to it. So I'm going to say they're few and far between. Uh, but I don't actually know the answer. Tal Vivaro is actually north of the Odukampu district in Finland. It's approaching the Arctic Circle. It's in the Arctic. Oh. But because they're using an activated biological solution, the, the, the leach pad creates enough heat to keep the bacteria alive to do their job. It's crazy science when you get into it, what's going on. It's not just pour acid on a pile of rock and, you know, dissolve the rock. It's They've got bacteria eating their way through it. It's it's crazy stuff. Crazy stuff that uh, eventually we may even see at Surimo. Down we remote. might. We might. I'm, I'm speaking to a, a scientist who's actually in the biological remediation field and is looking at Tal Vivara, and I propose, you know, can we do a test at Surimo and then hitting more of this graphitic mudstone in the West End that's thicker near and at surface, that just makes it maybe it's possible because now if we have a concentration of the material, maybe we can get at it without too much effort and do some lab tests or little little bench tests. Problem is the market moves at one pace and science moves at a different pace. Yes. So you know, Tal Vivara, it took them years to get that to work. And it's proprietary as well. So we we will go down that path, but it's not gonna be a it's not gonna be a day trader fantasy by any stretch of the imagination. It's it's real work. Even geology, it's real science and it takes time. That's right, that's right. But still, like you mentioned, very good news and best case scenario. What would be the next steps going forward? Specific to the graphitic mudstone? Yeah. Specific to the graphitic mudstone, we're going to do more prospecting. The area is under tree cover, um, so we'll probably try to do some soil sampling. We don't expect a lot of outcrop. We can't see through the trees to determine. I mean, we have some incredible satellite imagery, photo photographs of the property, but they, all it sees is trees. That's what we use for the pegmatite exploration targets. But um, so soil, soil work, prospecting. It does have a magnetic signature, but we have an area with a fairly large magnetic signature to look at anyway. Now that we know the graphitic mudstone has a magnetic signature, that could well be the uh, explanation. It could also be the the EM because the EM is going to react to either the uh, graphitic shale or sulfides. So whereas we assume the reactions were all to sulfides, it could be the graphitic shale as well. So we we almost have to rethink some things. but. The next round is simple. Once we can get in the woods for both the the lithium question, because we have pegmatites to prospect, we have some other soil targets to prospect. 
Now we have to prospect and do soil work for this graphitic mudstone. And we still have other targets within the Victoria and the Lalonde systems themselves. And I just keep adding to the list of what I want the guys to do this summer. But at this rate, we'll get into the field later this summer. I have to think we'll be clear to be in the forest and uh, and I can get the guys. But uh, it's a long list of things. And it's probably a lot of soil work, to be very honest with you, because that's a great record. And it's easier to get a soil sample than it is to get outcrop. So it's basic basic exploration but it it generates data and it's quite exciting so we assay the soil just to explain what we do the soil samples taken from specific levels relative to the bedrock and it's sent for assay and then the assay because it'll the metals will move into the soils so then you get anomalies based on the metals in the soil and that allows you to target follow up stripping on some scale or maybe just drilling but uh it, it'll be interesting to see how the anomaly presents itself because there's very little soil there's a little bit of soil work that's been done but not a lot so it's what i like about surimo is that you just keep on adding to it and when i say add on is you keep on finding more things that i don't want to say take away from the property but add to its value because you're constantly finding something interesting on this property. And I think that's in that sense, we've mentioned it before, but this is what grassroots exploration is. Precisely. I mean, we're funny. We're a, we're a greenfields project. We're not totally grassroots greenfield in that we know we have mineralization, but it's an absolutely underexplored, massive property, but it's in a brownfield setting. I mean, we're in one of Canada's most mature mining camps in the Cadillac. Malartic Cadillac, there's a mining history that starts at the late 1800s. By the early 1900s, they had full-on mines running just to the north of us. It's the heart of Quebec's gold country, um, but it's it's some of the oldest mining in this country. And uh, yet, you know, we're a kilometer below this massive gold structure and nobody bothered to look. Why? Because they're, they're still mining the massive gold structure. They'll be mining that massive gold structure for based on our neighbor's uh, press release or information out last week, they've extended their life of mine at Canadian Malartic, which is our next door neighbor, to 2042. So they got another 20 years of mining on this structure. There's a reason this ground wasn't looked at. It's undercover. It's under the sediments. It's not easy to do the work. You have to do things a bit more abstract, like soil sampling and literally walking on the ground. That's okay. We're doing it. We've done the geophysics. We're doing all the basics, but we're finding things. And don't forget the the copper discovery in the north, the Beaupre copper. We have to go back there. We don't know where to go with it. It goes undercover. So we'll do some soil work or some other biological work. Speaking to a very smart young Quebecois geologist who does some biological work that he can probably do in the fall and winter for me in the area. And where we are, we can't go in the forest anyway. So, you know, it's uh, it's it's quite interesting. Surimo keeps growing and changing and we've got lithium, lithium targets. We've got the nickel system, large scale, seemingly low grade right now. But as we do a bit more work, because we've hardly drilled this property, we do a bit more work, grade can change. Can't get worse, can only get better. Um, we found gold and but gold by the drill bit, which was interesting in the shear zone of Victoria. Now we've got the graphitic mudstone. I mean, it just keeps, and I'm reading some of the targeting we're doing internally right now, which is quite interesting. Some of the things that uh, are being generated internally that you'll see us follow up on. But the first thing to circle back to your question, the first thing you'll see us doing will be some soil work um, later this summer. Just to remind the viewers, how massive is Cerebo? Because I think that's something that gets lost in translation as well. Well, completely. And it's also totally abstract when I say it. But for example, the Victoria structure, which has a road going down, not the center of it, the road's off to the west. But that Victoria structure goes across the middle of the property and it's 20 kilometers long. Huge. So, you know, for me, that's from my office to most of the way to downtown Toronto. 
I mean, 20 kilometers. Think about driving 20 kilometers. It's a lot of distance. And our geologists cover it on foot. They use an ATV and then they get out there and they traverse on foot. The property itself is 330 square kilometers. It's huge. It's four, four, four and a half times the size of the island of Manhattan. There's a lot of real estate there. We can't cover it all. But we can start vectoring in on it. One of the ways we vector in, we use satellite photos for the pegmatite. We use geophysics, which is useless for pegmatite. Um, you know, we use geophysics for some things are magnetic, but helpfully gold's not magnetic. So it has no geophysical signature. We use soil samples. We use walking around, prospecting on foot, looking for outcrop, banging rocks, putting the samples in the bag. Then when we feel we, we're onto something, we drill. So there's our techniques that slowly climb the ladder of both cost and um, expectation of results. But there are quite a few areas of interest uh, at Surimo. And it's tricky because every time I talk about one thing, somebody assumes the, the other thing I was talking about disappeared. Like I talked to you about the Beaupre copper discovery, which was actually made by SOCAM and ver verified and validated and explored by ourselves, by our own geologists. But if I talk about that, somebody will email me and say, well, what about the nickel thing? What happened to the nickel? Well, it didn't go anywhere. It's literally 10 kilometers south of where, well, it's more. It's probably 15 kilometers south of where Beaupre is, but it didn't go anywhere. I think when you have a property that's this big, Viewers or even investors tend to forget that, you know, when you look at a mining company exploration, sometimes they have properties at different places. But in this case, you have a massive property. It's all yours, 100% yeah. owned. Yeah. So in a sense, I'd say it's much better than having different claims everywhere For around sure. Quebec. But and it does. And, and, and I mean, in the future, you could see Surimo chopped up. For example... The lithium potential, the, the batholith in the south and the pegmatites, if we find spodumene in a pegmatite, it might be that somebody wants to buy those claims from us just to push that story forward. Maybe, maybe not. I'm not saying it's what I'd do, but there's enough claims we could chop that part of the property off. Houston, which is off the west, it could be severed on its own. It's a very interesting target which we found mineralization on, but we've never been back. We prospected it once. You know, Beaupre is up in the northeast corner near the Cadillac break. That could be somebody wants a copper play. There are ways to chop that property up, but there's no need to yet. But it's that big that I can talk to you. I've just spoken to you. Victoria, Lalonde, Pegmatites, Houston, Beaupre. That would be five projects, five different locations for another company and all five of those projects are on that one property that's 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 incredible so there's a lot of value at Surimo, a lot of value and i think especially well the market right now is in a funny place but still there's a lot of value at what you have there's a lot going on there's a lot of potential we can talk about value but we don't have a resource in place, so you can't really hang your hat on value as yet. But the potential, the number of things going on, and then the proximity to a massive geological structure and being in some of the last underexplored, ridiculously accessible, road accessible hydropower ground in southern Quebec. So we're not in the we're not in the plan nor we're not way up the the james bay lowlands or anything we're not too far from montreal so it's just crazy that the unexplored ground still sits there but not for long that's barrack is exploring barracks back they're exploring the superior province with a focus on the pontiac sediments because the pontiac sediments have been ignored so they're doing generative work we're a step ahead of them we're not generating we're trying to figure out exactly what we have but the big boys are here it's only a matter of time. They'll find something just because they'll put way more time and money into it than we will. But we've already got something. So we'll just keep working it. Well, I'm glad I get to talk to you, Nicole, because every time I see a news release, sometimes I don't understand. I think most investors, they have a hard time understanding because they don't know all the technical side of it. But this is good news. 
It's good news, but if you're on my email list, and I feel like you are, um, you know, you'll get the email and hopefully it'll give people a little bit more of an understanding of why it was a press release worth putting out. And if if, if it doesn't make it clear, people just have to call me and ask. That's another thing that's that's often not mentioned, and I, I can't stress it enough to the new investors. You can reach the CEO anytime, right? Well, you should be able to. can certainly reach me. So if you don't understand, just call me, email me. Well, Nicole, thank you very much for this follow-up on this news release. I'm I'm happy with what I'm hearing. I think investors will be too, but if they're not sure, they can always give you a call, like you just said. Precisely. And and you know, we're we're doing some neat stuff in the background. We can't be in the field, but we will be shortly. And uh yeah, stay tuned. Things going on. So. Well, thank you, Nicole. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Well, if you made it this far, you must be a real fan. So you better smash that like button, let us know what you think down below. And if you're not subscribed already, do that and turn on that little notification bell so you don't miss a single one of our videos. While you're at it, check out the last one. It was a real good one. And until next time, see ya.